So it's New Year's Eve 2017. Tonight when the clock strikes 12, the whole world will roll into a new year, 2018. Seems kind of hard to believe. One thing I've learned, the older you get, the years seem to like roll by faster. Have you noticed that? It's like accelerating. It's true. Even as we sit here this morning, thousands of people are already gathering in Times Square in New York City to celebrate the coming of the new year as they've done every year since 1907. By about 9 o'clock this evening, there will be nearly a million people jammed into those couple of city blocks just to celebrate the coming of a new year. That looks like fun, doesn't it? <laughs> a million people braving the cold. It's going to be like minus 4 degrees wind chill factor tonight in Times Square. Uh, braving uh, all that cold and the crowds, the crush of people, just to watch that ball drop for that one minute to mark the end of 2017. And by the way, the moment that ball drops, which is 12 feet in diameter, weighs nearly 12,000 pounds, it's got 672 LED lights on it and 2,688 Waterford, Waterford Crystal Triangles, which will tell us about 15 times on the broadcast tonight. But when that ball drops, when the clock strikes midnight, they're going to release 3,000 pounds of confetti, which is 30 million pieces of paper, by hand across Times Square. Fun! right? Has anybody done that, been to Times Square? So far in every service, at least one person. Nobody? Well, I hope I get this right because I do some reading about it. That's the fun part, but what's the not fun part? There is a not fun part to this whole thing. To get your spot in the crowd, to be able to at least hold a spot and be able to see, you have to get there early. Some are getting, some got there last night, some are there right now, and some will wait 9, 10, 11 hours standing there until the ball drops. And here's the problem. Do you know how many public restrooms they have in Times Square? For one million people, zero. Not a single port john in Times Square for a million people. Do you know what they sell? They sell adult diapers. A pack of 17 for 20 bucks. That's what people do. I didn't know that. Unless you, and they also sell no food. There are no food vendors open in Times Square. Unless you want to buy a seat at Applebee's or a local restaurant, which is $350 a person to sit inside Applebee's, have access to a restroom. So that's the not fun part. So for those of us who aren't willing to have that kind of fun, and we're not going to be there in person, many of us will watch on TV. Almost 100 million of us will watch tonight on TV. How many will watch at least a part of the celebration? I'll watch a little bit of it. Did you know that 22% of us will be asleep? By midnight, 22% of Americans will be asleep. I will be one of them, I think. Here's a question. Why do we celebrate New Year's Eve? Why do we celebrate the coming of the new year? I did a little research, found out that historians now believe that even though ancient cultures all had wildly different calendars, that people still celebrated what they thought was the beginning of a new year based on what their calendar told them. And it goes back 4,000 years in human history. In fact, we celebrate on January 1st because in 46 B.C., Julius Caesar realigned the Roman calendar with the sun, and he added the month January after the pagan god Janus. See, that's, I didn't even know that. That's why we have January. And he made January 1st the beginning of a new year because it aligned with the sun or whatever like that. But Janus was depicted, this pagan god, as having two faces, one face back and one face forward. Now, the point of all this is that human beings have always marked a new year with celebrations. The question is why? Why are we sort of hardwired to do this sort of thing? I saw an article online um, from a publication called Psychology Today where the author speculated that human beings have celebrated the coming of a new year throughout history for two main reasons. First, survival. We're still here. Second, hope. Hope for good fortune or better luck in the coming year. And all that makes sense. Human beings are just built that way. But here's a question for today. How does our faith shape the way we think about the coming of a new year? Does it at all? And then again, does it shape significantly how we think about a new year? I'm going to start with one of the oldest parts of the Bible. The book of Ecclesiastes which scholars believe written about 2,500 years ago. Listen to these words come, that come from the first chapter. The words of the teacher 
son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What the people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun. Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. Verse 8, all things are wearisome. More than one can say, the eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was already here long ago. It was here before our time. That's not exactly the cheeriest portion of scripture I could choose kind of depressing in its own way, but all the Bible is saying there, all the ancient wisdom writer is saying is that everywhere you look, you see something old. That's the first thing I want to talk about today, something old, or as the ancient teacher says, there's nothing new under the sun. A couple of weeks ago, in the middle of the build-up to Christmas, um, I was home uh, late in the afternoon, one of my boys came home from where he works, which is out of the middle school in Batavia, he came home and he walked in and he was wearing one of my sweaters from my closet. I looked up and said, hey, nice sweater. He said, yeah, it was ugly sweater day at school today. <laughs> Is that really that ugly? That's a rhetorical question. You don't have to raise your hand or anything. But when I got, got over the, you know, the pain of that comment, I said, well, you just wait and see. I hold on to that sweater long enough, it'll be back in style again. What has been will be again, says the teacher. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. And that's really true. In so many ways, consider fashion. Fashions do go out of style, and then they reappear again. Consider, for example, eyeglasses. I found this picture from a yearbook in 1960s. Two sharp-looking young guys. Here's what eye fashion looks like today. Not all that much different. Consider men's suits. Know these four guys? The Beatles in the early 60s? Here's what men's fashion looks like today. Not all that much different, is it? What goes around comes around. There's nothing new under the sun. Not just true in fashion. It's true with history itself. History tends to revolve and repeat itself. Two of my boys recently took a trip to Mexico just for fun, and they were visited the famous Mayan ruins in a place called Chichen Itza, not far from Cancun. Many of you have been there. Right at the center of this ancient uh, archaeological dig is a huge pyramid, like 100 feet tall, and then go back to the, yeah, like 100 feet tall, magnificent piece of ancient engineering, but just to the side of that pyramid is an open field, a large field. And here, a lot of anthropologists believe this was a kind of an ancient playing field for a contest or a game, because this field is surrounded by two high walls on both sides, and on one of the walls, about 20 feet up, there's a ring attached to the wall. And they now believe that two teams of ancient warriors would push a rubber ball back and forth, kick it, hit it, bump it with their hips to see who could push the ball farther. And then if they could make it go through that ring, 20 feet up in the air, the game was over. They won the game. And then they sacrificed the winning team to the gods. That is what some scholars think. Now, a thousand years later, we still play games with a ball and a hoop. We just don't sacrifice them to the gods afterwards, right? If we look back over the events that have dominated our news cycle in our culture in the past year, we see that things don't change all that much. Political strife, that's nothing new. Natural disasters, violence, war, human evil, even the solar eclipse comes round and round again. The ancient writer says, all things are wearisome, more than one can say. And what about people? Do people change over the centuries? Did you see the story that came out right before Christmas, during the Christmas rush? A riot broke out in a Walmart because people were fist fighting over the last TV set to purchase for their family. It really happened. Or my wife and I were driving just a week or so before Christmas and in kind of a traffic crunch. You know, people were driving everywhere. And we were stuck in a place where we're merging onto another, into, in, into a road. And so, you know, the, the etiquette there is, especially at Christmas time, you know, you let someone go in front of you, then you take your turn, then the next person goes, and then people are waving, Merry Christmas, good to see you, Merry Christmas, you know, total strangers. So I'm waiting my space in line, and I'm waving people, oh, Merry, Merry Christmas, go, you go ahead of me. Then my turn came, it was my turn to go, merging. 
And the guy who should have looked at me and said, Merry Christmas, you go in front of me, he just didn't even look at me. He drove past, and he sped up to take my spot. It gained him like two seconds, but he did it. I was like, hey, it's Christmas. <laughs> is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was already here a long time ago, here before our time. The way we say this today, of course, is the more things change, the more they stay the same. The whole world is something old, the ancient writer said. But in the midst of all this oldness, there is something new. There is something new. How many of you either gave or received new clothes for Christmas? Anybody? That's a pretty common gift. Our boys have gotten older now. We don't do the toy thing so much anymore, but it's a lot of clothes. Clothes they need, clothes they want, and so forth. But giving clothes for Christmas can be a little bit of a <coughs> risky venture because you can get something your loved one doesn't really like that much and they pretend they like it and then they take it back and exchange it. You can get something that's the wrong size. And if you get the wrong size, you can unintentionally send an unintended message. This is the medium. I wear a small. What are you trying to say to me? Well, not, just nothing. Or you can do what I did a couple of years ago. That is, it got right down to like a week before Christmas, and I do my shopping kind of late. I get kind of in the spirit. So I hurried out to the store, you know, finding something for my wife. And I, I, I you know, I'm, I, when I'm in that mode, I hunt. You know, I'm, I'm just, you just hunt, shoot, and take it out, right? You want to be as fast as you can, right, guys? So I go to the store, and almost right away I see an outfit on a, man, on a mannequin. It looks great. I, I like that. shoe. looks great, and I, I think she'll like that. So I purchased the whole thing. The sweater, the skirt, the jewelry, everything. Right up, right, took the whole mannequin, almost a mannequin. Took, took everything home, put it in the box under the tree. So Christmas morning comes, she opens it, and she actually seemed reasonably happy with it. And then after everything was over with, she took me up to our room. She said, hey, I want to show you something. Walked into the closet, and there in the closet was the exact same outfit <laughs> that I bought for her the very previous Christmas. <laughs> the exact same thing two years in a row. Now, the whole point of giving clothes is to give something new. In 2 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul talks to us about newness. He says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is passed away. Behold, the new has come. So Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun. The Apostle Paul says the old is passed away and the new has come. How does Christ make us new? Okay, here's a little gospel review. The good news of the gospel is that Christ gives us four news. First, he gives us a new heart. He gives us a new heart because we are forgiven. In Colossians 2 we read, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. But I want you to see there is that little word all, just three letters, A-L-L, -L, but such an important word. Because I think we have this tendency to sort of reconstruct that verse and that promise in our minds and hearts. We read, he forgave all our sin. What we think and feel in our hearts is he forgave most of my sin. You know, he forgave all of it except that one that I really can't forgive myself for. He forgave all of it except, oh, that one is really bad. He's going to get me for that one sooner or later. Listen, Jesus didn't go to the cross, didn't shed his blood, didn't endure separation from his heavenly father, to make sure we were mostly forgiven. To make sure we were kind of forgiven. To make sure we were partly forgiven. He went to the cross to make sure we were all the way forgiven. He forgave all our sin. And when we understand that we have been forgiven to have new hearts, we have new life. That actually allows us to afford to forgive others. In Ephesians 4, we read, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ 
God forgave you. A new heart gives us the capacity to offer that same forgiveness to others. Another way to say it is our capacity to forgive others is related to our own experience of Christ's forgiveness for our sins. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that it's impossible for us to forgive others until we've actually experienced Christ's forgiveness of our own sins. It's impossible. You can't do it. Because you don't know what forgiveness even is. First promise is we have new hearts. Secondly, we have new identity. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. What this is telling us is that Jesus didn't come to make us nicer people. That's a byproduct of what he came to do. He didn't come to make us better people, a better version of ourselves. That's a byproduct of what he came to do. Jesus came to make us new creations. He came to make those who are spiritually dead live again. Our culture is consumed with the issue of identity. And our cultural message is you have to find your true identity. You have to be who you really are. And so we desperately try to anchor our identity in ourselves, in what we feel, in what we can do, in what we think makes us unique. The problem is it can't be done. Because our feelings change. Because we can always find someone else that does what we do better than we do it. Because we can find somebody else who's more unique than we are. So we can't find our identity. In Romans 8, the Apostle Paul says, The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. The Bible tells us that by faith we are adopted as children of God. That our identity is no longer anchored in what we feel, and what we feel about ourselves. It's no longer anchored in what we do. It's no longer anchored in how unique we think we are. It's anchored in who loves us and who chose us to be his children. So when we rely on our culture to tell us who we are, we are slaves to fear, the Bible says. When I rely on my feelings about myself to tell me who I am, I'm a slave again to fear. When I rely on what I can do or what I can't do as my identity, I'm a slave again to fear. But when we allow Jesus to tell us who we are, the one who created us in his own image and who redeems us by his own sacrifice, when we allow him to tell us who we are and how much we are loved, we become sons and daughters no longer slaves. We receive new identity. New hearts, new identity. Thirdly, new purpose. In Ephesians 2 we read, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, if you've been around Chapel Street for any length of time, you know we are constantly inviting you and challenging you to get involved with serving, to serve somewhere in Shepherd's Heart Care Center, in our food pantry, in Buddy Break, our ministry to families with children of special needs, with children's ministries, student ministries, women's ministries, short-term missions, local serving opportunities, serving somewhere in your neighborhood. We're constantly putting these opportunities out there. But we don't do that because we want to run lots of programs. We don't do that because we want you to feel a little bit better about yourselves by doing some nice things now and then. We do it because the gospel tells us that in Christ, we have new hearts, new identity, and new purpose. We now live for something greater than ourselves. And we want you to know who you already are. So serving is part of our new purpose. And then fourthly, we've been promised new destiny. New destiny. I got a text on Christmas Eve somewhere that day as I drove back and forth between our ten services, nine on Christmas Eve, got a text on my phone. When I stopped at one of the campuses, looked at what it was, and it was from the granddaughter of a man who had attended our church for about the last 11 years. Um, 
who I visited a couple of weeks earlier in his home as he was in failing health. Had uh, an ongoing battle with cancer and dementia and all sorts of things going on. And she was just texting me, let, letting me know her grandfather was hooked into a coma and was very near death, just so I was prepared. So I texted her back, and then he did pass away the day after Christmas, early in the morning. So I'm going to do his service here in about a week and a half or so for the family. But when I do that service, I'm going to be so glad to be able to read these words, 1 Peter chapter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth, new heart, new identity, new purpose, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance, this is our destiny, that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Here's why the gospel matters. Sooner or later, maybe in 2018, maybe in 2019, maybe in 2038, whenever, every single one of us is going to be where that man was a couple of days ago. That is, right at the end of earthly life. And at that moment, we all need hope. Hope in what? Hope in the changing of a calendar of the year? What kind of hope is that? That's just hope in hope. We have hope because we've been promised a new destiny by the one who is even now preparing a place for us because Jesus has promised. So something old, something new, I want to end with a question. What do you want? What do you want? We all know that at the end of the year, the tendency for people to look back and kind of take stock, what's gone well, what hasn't gone well, to look ahead. And many, many people in our culture um, sort of make promises to themselves. Sometimes we call them New Year's resolutions. Lose weight, get out of debt, get more fit, quit smoking, spend more time with family. The top resolution for 2018, I read these lists every year, the top resolution for 2018 is be a better person. Sort of sums it all up. What I find is interesting to me is that these lists that come out every year at the end of the year are almost always exactly the same in our culture. The same five, six, seven things show up across the board. We all kind of want the same thing. In Philippians chapter 3 in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul talks to us about what he wants. Let me read these verses to you. Not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. See your identity in that statement? Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. The one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining toward forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let, th let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. For years, this has been one of my very favorite passages in the New Testament. First, because it's honest. This is the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament himself under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. This is Paul who says, I'm not there yet. I don't have it all together yet. I'm not where I will be someday. I like that. He's honest. And then it's also active and dynamic. He says, I straining, pressing on. <coughs> it's challenging. requires focus and effort. It's also simple and clear. He says, one thing I do. There's one thing on my list. It's actually one thing with two parts. He says, first, forgetting what lies behind. Anyone here ever heard of Good Riddance Day? Good Riddance Day. I just read about it this week. Evidently, a few years ago, uh, a company that makes shredders started this tradition. It takes place on December 28th in Times Square. So it took place this past Thursday. They drive a big truck in the Times Square that's got a giant shredder in it. You know, a paper shredder. And people come from all over. Hundreds of people come from all over and they bring stuff to shred that reminds them of things they need to let go of. Photographs of people from a break, broke up, broken up relationship. Uh, they bring uh, tax bills and medical bills and uh, letters that, that remind them of painful memories. 
and they have forms there you can fill out to write something down and then shred it. And they shove all this stuff in a shredder. It's good riddance day. I think that's kind of what Paul's talking about when he says forgetting what lies behind. I think he means he's trying to forget. He's forgetting the false anchor points for his own identity through the years. This is Paul, who at one time was Saul of Tarsus, a proud, educated man, powerful, enforcer of the law, supremely religious. And he's saying, shred it all. Shred all that stuff because I now have new identity in Christ. Forget what lies behind. I think he's forgetting the sin and the failure and the disappointment earlier in his life. Because Paul persecuted followers of Jesus, threw them in prison, had them mistreated, stood beside and approved as Stephen was stoned to death for his faith in Christ. Paul's saying, shred it all. It's all been shredded because I have a new heart, because I've been forgiven. All my sin has been forgiven. He says, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on. The language Paul uses here is borrowed from the athletic world. It means to run after, to pursue, to earnestly desire. The images of an athlete, a runner, pressing for the finish line, trying to hit the tape first, focused with all his passion and all his energy on finishing that course. I press on toward the goal, he says, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, what is that? What's the upward call? Simply put, I think it's to become what Jesus has already made him to be. To become what Jesus has already made him to be. See, Paul knows Jesus has more for him. More love, more joy, more service, more hope, more life. But it's not back there. It's not back in the old things. It's out ahead. It's in the new thing. And that's his message to us, too. Jesus has more for you than you could ever imagine. More love and more joy and more service and more hope and more life. But it's not back there. It's out there in front. A few years ago, my brother uh, Joe, on the occasion of his 50th birthday, uh, decided to do an Ironman triathlon with his son, Jeremy. It was, I think it was kind of a midlife crisis he was having or maybe a moment of temporary insanity. Because the triathlon is the big one. That's where you like swim two and a half miles in open water, then you bike 112 miles, then you run a full marathon, 26 miles at the end of it. These are incredible feats of endurance. And he's got an arthritic knee, but he decided to do it with his son. Uh, so they spent almost a whole year training, swimming, biking, running together. And on the night before the event, he said they hold a banquet. This one was, I think, in Louisville. And at the banquet, they honor all these different people, like the youngest person in the triathlon the next day, the oldest competitor, person who's, who's won the most races, who had the best times. And then they had one guy who was the got person who had competed in the most triathlons. And it was, he said they, they got this guy up on stage, like a 77-year-old man. It was like his 50th triathlon. It was really impressive, but my brother's looking at this guy thinking, how in the world does a 77-year-old man do a triathlon? It must take him forever. So that's what he's thinking. So the, day of the, the next day comes, and it's time for the, for the race. He and his son do the swimming together, stay right together, do well. Do the biking together. My brother was a good biker, did all that together. But when it came to the run, which is the full marathon, 26 miles, they split, they split up because his son could run faster than he could. He's got an arthritic knee. He had to sort of walk, jog, walk, jog, walk, jog. So it took him six hours just to do the marathon part. So he's 13 hours into the triathlon now. He can barely walk. He said it was by far the hardest thing he's ever done. And he was an athlete in college and all that. But he said he finally got to where he could see the finish line, like 200 yards ahead. And he's just, just trying to get there. He can barely stay upright. And then he hears a noise, a sound coming from behind him. And he can tell from the sound someone's gaining on him. And when the sound gets right up next to him, he looks, and it's the 77-year-old man. <laughs> Which means for 13 hours, the guy's been catching him. For 13 hours. And he said he looked at him, and he realized who it was, and he said something snapped inside him. And he looked at him, and he said, not today, buddy. And he <laughs> sprinted the last 100 yards all the way to the tape, 
beat the guy to the end, and they had this big hug. They all laughed about it and all that. But I think that's kind of what Paul's talking about. He's talking about straining toward the finish line. With all one's passion and all one's energy, forgetting what's behind. The old is gone. The new has come. So press on. Press on to the high calling that God has for you. Will you bow with me as I close? Lord, we thank you for your word today. Thank you for reminding us that the more things seem to change around us, the more they really just stay the same. But our hope is not in the old things of this world, but rather in the new thing you want to do in us and through us. New hearts, new identity, new purpose, new destiny. Remind us that the new you want to do in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our relationships, and even in the world is through the new you do in us. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray.